Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to everyone here in the faculty club and those online. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Jim Gurr to introduce our speaker. Uh, thank you, Michael. <clears throat> so I met Paul this morning for the first time and I said I was introducing him and I said I made it all up. So what I've got wrong, Paul, you can correct. You go on the web and you never know. <laughs> yeah, that's a oh, good one. Okay, so I, I thought I would start with a couple of headlines uh, gleaned from nature over the past year or so. There's an introduction. So I, know, I got a few of these. It's a dream. JWST spies more black holes than astronomers predicted. Uh, JWST being the James Webb Space Telescope. Another one is JWST spots the most distant smoke molecules ever seen in space. Stunning new web images, baby stars, colliding galaxies, and hot exoplanets. How JWST has revolutionized astronomy. So it's, it's pretty exciting times uh, for astronomy. It seems that almost every week some new or startling revelation appears in the press or online to, from, this, from the space telescopes. So Paul Delaney, our speaker today, will help us understand the evolution of space telescopes, as it says, and how we arrived at the present exciting moment in the, the exploration of space. Paul grew up in Australia, as you'll find out when he starts to speak, uh, where he developed an early interest in astronomy. And this is probably not too surprising for the, those of us who've been in, in the Southern Hemisphere and fortunate enough to look up the skies. The stars in the Southern Hemisphere are spectacular. How could you not be interested in astronomy? Uh, Paul received his BSc from the Australian National University in Canberra. And then for reasons that only he knows, decided to travel north where he obtained an MSc from the University of Victoria in British Columbia. He's worked as a nuclear physicist for Atomic Energy of Canada and as a support astronomer at the McGraw-Hill Observatory in Arizona. Uh, Paul has been a member or was a member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at York University from 1986 until his recent retirement but apparently is still teaching on his schedule, not their schedule. For this entire period at York, he was the director of the Allen I. Carswell Astronomical Observatory. And in 2018, he was the inaugural Allen I. Carswell Chair for the Public Understanding of Astronomy. Uh, during his time at York, he served as the director of the Division of Natural Science, and for 10 years, it was the Master of Bethune College. Uh, Paul is well known for his public outreach for science, appearing frequently on radio and television to discuss topics related to astronomy and I guess other science issues as well. For many years, he hosted a weekly one hour internet program called York Universe, which had a large international audience. And currently, and I guess in recent years to pay for his sins, he's had the unenviable position of having to give talks on astronomy on cruise ships. <clears throat> this is a gig I can only dream about. Uh, Paul has received numerous awards for his teaching and communication to science to the public, and uh, just a, a few of which include, uh, he was a top 10 finalist in TV Ontario's best lecture competition. He was York, won uh, York University President's Teaching Award. He was the winner of the Royal Canadian Institute 2010 Sanford Fleming Medal for Outstanding Contributions to the Public Understanding of Science. Uh, in 2015, he was the recipient of the KELAC Award from the Canadian Astronomical Society, recognizing his ongoing commitment to the public awareness and understanding of astronomy. And the list goes on. You get the picture. He communicates about science, and he does it extremely well. So I think we're in for a treat. So, Paul, I give the mic to you. Just start my timer here because I promised Linda I wouldn't go beyond 50 minutes. 
I will indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and that was great. I mean, it was perfect. I mean, you know, I've had all sorts of people introduce me over the years. Trust me, that was probably the best. So thank you. I'll bring you along on the next cruise ship. <laughs> no, my wife would probably disagree with that. Anyway, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me today. Uh, I do like talking about many aspects of astronomy and space science. This particular talk, though, is one that I've been wanting to do for a long time. And I think this was a great opportunity for it. So this is the first time I've actually presented this. As Jim indicated, it doesn't seem to be more than a week between announcements from the James Webb Telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. Also, of course, Hubble keeps sneaking in there. It's still uh, active and continuing its wonderful journey, which is now 33 years and counting. But before we get to both of those telescopes, and I certainly will in this presentation, I want to bring you back literally over a century back to the very beginnings where people began to think about using the space environment for astronomical endeavors. And the very first thing I do, it didn't advance. Let's try that again. There we go. Very good indeed. Okay. So if we go all the way back to the mid 1920s, the early 20th century was the time of rocketry. That's when all sorts of people like Oberth, von Braun, uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, uh, Goddard, were working hard to take us from literally aircraft activity, ground-based activities into the space environment. And to do that, you needed a lot of energy. And that was where rocketry came in. But rocketry was in its infancy at this point in time. But nonetheless, people recognized almost from the outset that if we can deploy assets into Earth orbit above the obscuration of the Earth's atmosphere, then at least astronomically speaking, this would be a huge win. And as everybody in this room is aware, because we've all lived throughout the space age, it's not just looking up, which has dominated activities in space. It's also been looking down, uh, you know, search and rescue, weather satellite predictions and so on. So the space environment has had many, many wonderful opportunities. But as I said, a century ago, people were beginning to dream about the possibilities in Earth orbit. Now, the three individuals who I'm citing here, Oberth, Goddard, and uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, they were engineers, they were theoreticians, they were not astronomers. But Lyman Spitzer, he was an astronomer. And in the 1940s, he recognized with the advent of technology, V2 rocket technology, then the possibilities of being able to deploy assets in Earth orbit was actually not that far away. And so Lyman Spitzer worked tirelessly throughout his life to make this happen. The Hubble Space Telescope we've all heard about. You've probably heard some of these other telescopes. Hubble is actually the visible light member of a family of big astronomical telescopes. And as you will soon see, telescopes in orbit have been around a long time and there's been lots of them. But the big ones, the great observatories, as NASA referred to, covered areas of the electromagnetic spectrum that we cannot access from the surface of the Earth. Here on the ground, we are able to see visible light. That's the sunlight that comes through to us. And we can eavesdrop on the universe at radio wavelengths. But X-rays, gamma rays, infrared, there's a whole raft of frequencies, wavelengths out there, which are delivering information about the way the universe is operating that we just cannot access from the surface of the Earth. And as I said, this was realized a long time ago, but it was only with the advent of the space age as of October 4th, 1957, that we had the opportunity to deploy assets that would access these other areas. So NASA embarked on its great observatories program. Hubble was the visible component, the visible light component, but you can see here Chandra, Compton, uh, and Spitzer, they mapped out other areas of the electromagnetic spectrum. Hubble is still operating, so too is Chandra. Uh, just for completeness, uh, Robert Goddard launched the first liquid fuel rocket there from Massachusetts in 1926. And at that point in time, uh, it, it didn't go very far. It didn't go very high. But nonetheless, it was the first liquid fuel rocket that didn't blow up and actually went somewhere. Uh, the flight was literally only about 11 seconds. But hey, it was a turning point as far as history was concerned. Okay. 
So, as I said, the space age began 1957, and Lyman Spitzer was quite correct in his advocating that this was going to be a huge opportunity. As you will see in a moment, he certainly pushed hard for it. The first UV spectrum of our sun was taken in 1946 from a suborbital mission. It was a V-2 rocket. Von Braun and the German war effort ended up in uh, the US and the Soviet hands after World War II, and the development of bigger and better rocketry uh, took place in parallel in both those countries. Mostly out of White Sands in New Mexico, that's where the V-2 program and Von Braun was working initially, and that's where some of the first science-sounding rockets actually were launched from. And as you can see there, about 88 kilometers up, we managed to snap a UV spectrum of the sun. But it wasn't until the 1960s that we were actually able to take satellites from the surface of the Earth and deploy them into Earth orbit for long periods of time. The, the V2 flights to 88 kilometers and so on, they literally last minutes tops. Uh, and that's you know just not enough time for us to do serious science. It gives you a snapshot, but doesn't give you much more than that. So the OSO, the Orbiting Solar Observatory, launched in 1962. That was when we really began to get our feet wet with respect to observing from Earth orbit. Now, remember, when you're observing from Earth orbit, you've got a couple of things that you have to always be aware of. One is the Earth, okay? It's this big ball that's immediately beneath the satellite's feet, so as to speak, and that casts a great deal of light contamination into your satellite's capabilities. And so observing from Earth orbit might sound easy, but you've always got to be aware of where the Earth is. There's that other thing called the moon. That's not cool, okay? The sun, yes, that's fine. So there's a little bit of choreography that has to be engaged in. And so when you think about orbital activity, don't just think, gosh, you've got a telescope and we're pointing wherever we like. No, it doesn't work like that. And they realize this early on. So as I said, there were a number of early orbiting satellites that were doing astronomy. And of course, the easiest target, remember, this is the early days of rocketry, long before any significant computerization existed, that the first targets were, in fact, the sun. Uh, that's not to say that we didn't try looking at other things, but the OSOs really were designed to give us an understanding of our sun from a vantage point that we had yet to be able to achieve. I point out that uh, you know the the clean room of today, you've probably seen NASA and all of their various technicians. They are wrapped to the hilt, you know in plastic bags, hoods, masks, everything to keep the environment as clean as possible. I like this particular image because it sort of suggests that you're doing it in your garage. Um, it, it, it wasn't quite that bad, but nonetheless, things have changed quite dramatically with respect to the generation of equipment and the protective status that they have here on the earth before we deploy them into earth orbit. Also, look at the size. This was OSO-1. And it's comparable in size to a human being. When we get to Hubble, when we get to James Webb, you're going to see that the scale has grown dramatically over the last 60 years. Of course, it wasn't just NASA that was engaged in this type of activity. There were scientists around the world who were getting excited about the ability to deploy assets into Earth orbit. The United Kingdom launched Ariel 1 very shortly after OSO 1, and it too was giving us another opportunity to observe the sun, and that was uh, uh, in the uh, X-ray area. Interestingly enough, both Ariel 1 and OSO 1 had foreshortened lives because of, this was the era of airborne nuclear testing. And so there was a test mission of some description. I don't know all the details. I just know it was a very large bomb that was uh, detonated in the upper atmosphere. And of course, some of the fallout, the radiation from that detonation actually impacted the satellites that were in Earth orbit at that time. There weren't very many, but two of them, Ariel 1 and OSO 1, both were compromised as a result of the significant amount of radiation that was generated during the uh, detonation 
uh, there in 1962. So, yeah, not cool. Aerial One's launch there. And again, look at the, the size of the satellite on the left there, comparable in size to OS-01. So they were fairly small payloads back at that era in time. After we figured out how we could actually observe the sun very successfully, the next obvious target were of a more astronomically interesting in nature. And so the orbiting astronomical observatories, there were four of them in toll, uh, were launched later in the 60s and in, operated deep into the 1970s. In fact, I think um, uh, OA03 uh, was operational until about 1981, roughly speaking. So now... We're moving to harder targets. This required us the uh, ability to point our instruments with ever increasing detail. Again, the night sky is very, very large. And when you're trying to find a particular star, a particular galaxy, a particular target, it requires a great deal of finesse to actually find it. I'm not sure how many amateur astronomers we have listening in, but I'm sure you all have gone out with your telescopes on occasions, looked at the object in question and go, that's not it, because it's very hard to find them. Uh, and so back in the 1960s, when, again, we were still developing technology, it wasn't easy to point our telescopes that were in Earth orbit. But nonetheless, this is where we were gaining our experience, gaining some better understanding on how to operate things in low Earth orbit. And so even though there were only four OAO missions, Two of them were remarkably successful, and they really did pave the way for what could be achieved in Earth orbit. I mentioned one particular person, Nancy Grace Roman. She was the first astronomy chief for NASA. It was a division in the science area of NASA, and even though NASA was you know, fiercely focused on the moon race at this point in time, they had set aside some measure of funding for more scientific endeavors, not just going to the moon. And uh, Roman actually recognized the importance of delivering quality results from Earth orbit to build a platform that would allow for bigger and better telescopes. She often, in fact, inherits the title of the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope. So important was she in these early decades. As I said, there were two of those four OAO missions that were very successful. I just uh, mentioned uh, the Stargazer so here. I love the name, actually, more than anything else. Uh, and OAO2 showed the capabilities of detecting things that we weren't expecting, like the hydrogen envelopes that surround comets, and comets we find by the dozens every single year. There are literally probably billions of cometary nuclei surrounding our solar system, and dozens of new ones are found every single year. And you know they are a time capsule. They give us insight into the earliest moments of the formation of our solar system. It's why astronomers get very, very excited when a new comet is found, and especially one that might come close to the Earth. And in this particular instance, Stargazer was up at the right time. It had a look at this particular comet. These are the three uh, Japanese observers who found it for the first time, and we found a hydrogen envelope. Uh, this particular satellite had figured out how to point, uh, and we found over 5,000 what we call ultraviolet uh, excess stars. So the value of Earth orbit was being demonstrated, much to Roman's delight. And this was OAO3, the Copernicus satellite. And again, you can see they're getting bigger, okay? You can see the comparison uh, of the person there with the actual telescope. So you know, we're making great strides. In this regard, really bigger is better. Okay, so we've now recognized and probably delivered a message to the NASA administration and, and their equivalents around the world that Earth orbit really is very, very beneficial. Not only are you clear of the Earth's atmosphere, the obscuration of the Earth's atmosphere, you don't have to worry about cloud, you're not blocking any of the wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, those signatures that are coming to us from a variety of different energy sources in the universe as a whole, the ability to create what we call diffraction-limited optics 
that take full advantage of the space environment. This is what really excited Lyman Spitzer in particular. And as I indicated, he started thinking about this in the 1940s, but in the mid 1960s, he was in a significant position to actually affect change that would push, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, prospects for an orbiting space telescope. At that point in time, it was referred to as the Large Space Telescope. It was also affectionately referred to, oh, excuse me, <laughs> I shouldn't have had that cookie. I knew that. <laughs> so the Large Space Telescope was also referred to as the Giant Orbiting Device, G-O-D. Anyway, but it was officially referred to as the Large Space Telescope. By 1970, NASA had struck a couple of committees that would start assessing what was actually needed to be literally developed and invented to make a space telescope work really, really well. So even in 1970, they recognized that it was probably a 10-year lead time for this type of operation. Uh, and it was going to be, they thought, fairly inexpensive. Yeah, not really. Uh but by the time 1977 had rocked around, so seven years after NASA had outlined what was needed to be developed and executed, there still wasn't any budget for building the space telescope. And so interestingly enough, oh, and they also realized that with the other major project that NASA was working on, the space shuttle, that we had the opportunity to deploy this satellite into Earth orbit and go up and sort of, you know, service it to change out equipment as it failed so they recognized the importance of deploying this asset in low earth orbit despite the fact that the earth was big and you know was going to block a lot of the view and the moon was nearby and so on they realized the scientists of the day the scientists and the engineers realized that the space shuttle could be a huge asset in maintaining the large space telescope great foresight on their behalf as it worked out but as I said, by 1977, there was no real money to build this thing. And so the NASA administrator of the day, Fletcher, made a pretty bold move. He actually, he, he zeroed out the budget. The budget was only a few million dollars anyway, which was peanuts and was not going to build the space telescope anytime soon. And so he decided, okay, if we really want to get this telescope built, we have to have not only serious funding, but we have to have, if you will, vocal support from the astronomical community. They'd had support from the astronomical community, but vocal, no, uh, we're not a particularly um, energetic bunch when it comes to politics. And so by 1977, we hadn't really rallied around the project. So Fletcher decided to gamble and he zeroed out the budget. <laughs> did the trick. The astronomy community got very, very agitated about that, started writing to Congress. This is where Roman really got very uh, politically motivated. And the bottom line to it is that it suddenly became a high priority for the astronomical community, particularly the uh, American Astronomical Society, but astronomers from around the world really got behind it. And all of a sudden, money was being allocated from Congress. You can see that the amount was pretty minimal, you know, $30 million. I mean, that barely buys coffee these days for these committees, let alone building telescopes. But nonetheless, it was a step in the right direction. They thought that they could launch this space telescope by 1983. So this was 1977. Money is beginning to flow into the budget. They figured they could actually begin. They could get it all done and into orbit in 1983. Well, that date certainly came and went very, very quickly. They pushed it to 1984. Then they pushed it to 1986. We could write an entire book about the the uh, differing dates that were being allocated. And then, of course, we lost Challenger in 1986. And the space shuttle was to deploy the space telescope. So, of course, we ended up pushing the launch date all the way to 1990. Yes, it did get into orbit some 13 years after Fletcher's ploy, uh, and it was launched by Discovery April of 1990. So what was the telescope that was being proposed? Well, for those of you who are uh, you know, amateur astronomers at least, it's what we call a Cassegrain telescope. The optics are folded, so light comes down, strikes a primary mirror, goes back up to a secondary mirror sort of in the telescope tube, and then it bounces off that second mirror and down back towards the primary mirror through a hole in the primary mirror and out to various instruments. So you've got a series of mirrors that de uh, deflect the 
uh, incoming signal to whichever particular instrument you are most interested in. It ended up being a 2.4 meter diameter. That's a pretty good size, but it was certainly not the largest mirror that uh, existed on the Earth's surface at that point in time. So for example, the Palomar Observatory had a five meter diameter. So two and a half meters, a little under, was a pretty modest sized telescope. But again, we were limited by what you could cram into the nose cone of a rocket. And while we had some pretty good rockets at that point in time, the space shuttle was the cargo bay carrier for this telescope. And so a two and a half meter diameter mirror, literally with all of the you know bits and pieces associated with it, including the solar panels, that was as big as we could realistically go. And so that was limiting us. And of course, the plan was for it to be an optically optimized, uh, that is to say, a visible spectrum system uh, rather than any of the other infrared, ultraviolet X-rays and so on. This meant, of course, that the telescope was going to be relatively warm. Mm -hmm. And anytime you have a warm telescope, that is all you can use uh, in the in the uh, visible because in the infrared warm you basically just end up seeing your own telescope and so that was not good so hubble was from the outset dedicated to being purely an optical telescope the large space telescope was renamed in 1983 to be the hubble space telescope the edwin hubble telescope and it was this was named after edwin hubble who was the astronomer part of many in the 1920s that recognized that galaxies were entities unto themselves there was a big debate in 1920 whether or not we lived in a sort of a continuously occupied universe full of stars or whether or not there were the island universes around the place which tended to be eventually became known as galaxies and Edwin Hubble was the person who recognized that these galaxies were receding away from us. Literally, every galaxy bar a couple in the universe hates us, and they are running away from us furiously. And the further away those galaxies are, the faster they are moving, the expanding universe. So that's how Hubble got the name. The Hubble Space Telescope got that name. Relatively new technology. We didn't need the same level of glass support to maintain the figure of the mirror. The mirror has to be polished and ground to a very exacting nature. You don't need a lot of that mass to keep that structure uh, and that figure in place in orbit. So you can see the honeycomb nature behind the mirror surface. This is the backup mirror uh, that was created by Kodak for the primary mirror that was created by Perkin Elmer. Perkin Elmer was given the task of grinding this telescope to very exacting standards. Remember I said before, diffraction limiting, we want to be able to create an optical device that will be so precise that literally it'll be limited by physics, not by anything else. So the atmosphere is what limits our ability to define object size here on the surface of the Earth. Again, about one arc second, maybe half an arc second is the seeing limit uh, here on the surface of the Earth. You should be able to create a tenth of an arc second or less in Earth orbit if you are diffraction limited. And so the Hubble Space Telescope's mirror, was it was demanded of Perkin Elmer that it would reach those exacting standards. Of course, that would, has never been tried before. And so Perkin Elmer... They weren't the best subcontractor out there that NASA has ever utilized. Uh, they were running late with the development of the mirror. They certainly ran over budget. And you can see there that by the time we got to uh, 1983, we were up over a billion dollars. Remember that first allocation, 36 million? Okay, we're now at a billion dollars. Uh, I guess this is 1983 dollars. I'm not sure of that. But uh, whichever way you cut it, the, the, the cost of this telescope was beginning to balloon. And this was uh, a little bit of a worry, shall we say. I don't know why the guy's wearing a tie grinding a mirror, but that's besides the point. You get a feel for the size of the mirror. I mean, this is a good size mirror, two and a half meters in diameter. But as I indicated, it is certainly not the largest that existed at that point in time. And fast forward all the way to the James Webb telescope that we'll get to shortly. Uh, it has an effective mirror diameter of six and a half meters, some six times the light gathering capability of this mirror, which is the Hubble Space Telescope's mirror.
The plan called for five instrument bays. You can see these instruments listed here. They are basically cameras, spectrographs, and photometers. They are the tools that astronomers use to analyze the light signatures that are coming at us all the time. And so with images, we get a feel for how the deployment of galaxies and stars and so on are in a given patch of space. Spectrographs, spectroscopes, spectrometers, they allow us to dissect the light signal so we can figure out what those objects are made of. Photometers are very accurate measurements of the amount of light that we are getting. So all of these instruments were packed into Hubble. They were state-of-the-art instruments at that point in time. And to monitor the data flow, of course, we had to create a brand new organization, uh, basically the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, formed in 1981 at the John Hopkins University campus. This is what uh, Hubble looked like as they were deploying it from Discovery's payload bay there in 1990. For everybody who'd been working on this project, and remember the very first NASA committee that spoke about what was needed uh, as far as the Hubble telescope was concerned, was struck in 1970. Go back further than that, Lyman Spitzer in the mid 60s and so on. But let's let's call the start of serious thinking about Hubble to be in and around 1970. So we're 20 years after that first real work on the Hubble before Hubble gets deployed. And it deployed at a price tag, give or take a bit of about one and a half billion dollars. You can see here some of the numbers, and I do apologize. They are uh, moving around a little bit just to try and give you base dollars. And so you see 2010 references and 2015 references and so on and so forth. The takeaway message is that this telescope is comparable in cost to the James Webb telescope when you include the five shuttle servicing missions. So if you don't include the five shuttle servicing missions, sure, it, Hubble was very cheap compared to James Webb, but by the same token, the telescope would have stopped operating 15 years ago. So you've really got to include the fact that the servicing missions from the shuttle really have revitalized Hubble over time. In fact, by the time the final servicing mission flew in 2009, this is an image of Hubble taken by the astronauts as they flew away, just about everything in this telescope had been replaced with the exception of the mirror. So the solar panels had been replaced. We had replaced the onboard computer systems. Every single science instrument had been replaced. You name it, we had replaced the reaction control wheels, which allowed us to be able to observe the night sky with great fidelity. All of those had been changed out by the five shuttle servicing missions. For those of you who are interested in that piece of the history, here are the five dates. So you can see it spans about 15 years or so. But the most important one, though, in many ways, well, the two most important was the first one in 1993, and you'll see why in just a second. And then the final one, which was 2009, that one never, just about never happened because of the loss of Columbia in 1993. But nonetheless, that mission did actually fly. That one was responsible literally for keeping Hubble alive for the rest of its life. So that was 14 years ago. So we've not been able to go back and service for over 14 years. Hubble continues to operate very, very well. Just to give you the sense of scale here, the astronauts working in the payload bay of one of the space shuttles, uh, Discovery in particular, and they are actually, uh, you, you can see the size of Hubble because this is just the instrument bay, not the telescope mirror, not the rest of the optical tube, not the uh, the solar panels. So the the servicing missions really were a great triumph in many ways from both the space shuttle's capabilities, the astronauts who trained for these types of missions for a year or more in advance in a huge swimming pool in Houston, uh, and the fact that Today, Hubble still works so very, very well with even better instruments. It's great. Okay, so why was that first servicing mission really important in 1993? Because the Mirror was launched flawed. Now, one or a $1.5 billion telescope, and you launched with a Mirror that had spherical aberration. 
No amateur astronomer who makes telescope mirrors in their right mind would ever grind a mirror with spherical aberration. It is such a trivial thing to check for. Yet Perkin Elmer managed to create a null corrector, which is what you use for checking for spherical aberration. They made it incorrectly. And so they basically ground this mirror exquisitely well with great tolerance, but to the wrong figure so that the telescope basically had spherical aberration unbelievable would be uh, one term for it um uh, the allen commission did eventually identify what actually happened and blamed in large measure perkin elmer nasa had already had a great deal of difficulty with perkin elmer in the early 1980s but the allen commission came down fairly heavily on nasa as well as just not keeping an eye on your subcontractors very very well so regardless of how that problem did arise it was there and it basically meant that we had a mirror that was no better than the earth-based mirrors so even though it was above the atmosphere it couldn't see any better than the best telescopes here on the surface of the earth and as you can well imagine that was really a little bit disappointing after all of this time effort and energy it was not diffraction limited in, in any way shape or form but as i said to Perkin Elmer's credit, they did grind this mirror. They did figure this mirror really, really well. So well that we knew exactly how the mirror was wrong. And that allowed us to create a corrective optics package that would take the light and basically take the spherical aberration out of it before we passed it on to the rest of the instruments aboard Hubble. When we first heard about this, I remember this from the early 1990s, when this was first being proposed, everybody sort of just shook their head and thought, really? <laughs> Can we really do this? And so we took one of the instruments out of the payload bay of Hubble, uh, it was the uh, photometer, and we put in COSPAR. And COSPAR basically was a set of glasses that corrected for the spherical aberration and then fed the corrected light to the other instruments. That was the primary mission of servicing mission one. Here you can see the results. The far left-hand image is what a galaxy looked like pre-1993. So with the spherical aberration and then the cameras, wide field cameras, WIFPIC and so on, that's that's their, NASA loves the uh, acronyms, uh, WIFPIC two, and now we've got WIFPIC three, the three generations the quality of the imaging basically just soared back to diffraction limiting. And so everybody was extremely pleased with the results of COSPAR. With the future instruments, and we've swapped out instruments more or less regularly, uh, none of the original instruments exist, as you can see here. And I'm not going to go through all the acronyms, but as I said, they're basically cameras, spectrographs, photometers, and so on. Uh, now we have instruments that within their own internal dynamics correct for spherical aberration. So COSPAR disappeared uh, in and around 2002, and now all of the instruments on the Hubble Space Telescope correct that light for themselves. And so we're back up to five operate, well, one of those instruments, NICMOS, is not operational at the moment. We have five instruments on board. NICMOS is actually an infrared camera. The cooling that was being used to keep that camera down at really cold levels has finished it it, it it has been depleted and so nicmos is in a standby mode the, the the instrument hasn't failed but it isn't as useful as it once was and so at this point in time uh it is not operational but you can see that we have improved the quality of the instruments as a result of increased technology over the last, well, the, over the 19 years that the space shuttle was servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. So Hubble has been operational now for over 33 years. Iconically, this is probably one of the best images that uh, people recognize, the uh, you know, pillars of creation there in the Eagle Nebula. I could give you an entire presentation on just Hubble images. I'm not. It's taken tens of thousands of images. And uh, while, while science loves them, the public loves them even more, which is even better. What has Hubble managed to do? Well, one of the primary 
missions, one of the primary science objectives was the determination of what we call H naught, the Hubble constant. This is basically a measurement of the expansion of the universe. And without showing my age here, but I can do that amongst you guys because it's great. Uh, you know, H naught, when I was a graduate student, was given to us to be a value somewhere between, forget about the units, but 25 and 100. Factor four in astronomy is pretty good, actually. Uh, normally, we're happy if we get within an order of magnitude. So to have the Hubble constant between 25 and 100, that was really pretty good. As the years went by, this number has become refined, and Hubble produced a value of around about 73. We can talk over coffee or lunch, if you like, about the tension which exists because there are other techniques that have been used to measure H naught. They come in at 67, 67 and 73. They have error bars and they don't quite overlap. So there's this little bit of tension out there about what really is the value of H naught. But we're now talking about a 10% variation. I was talking about in my grad school of like 400%. So 10% to me strikes me as really, really good. So Hubble went ahead and created this terrific value of H naught. It has managed to image objects that we had never thought possible. Uh, we have certainly monitored exoplanets. It's managed to monitor exoplanetary atmospheres. To me, though, one of its greatest accomplishments was the Hubble Deep Field. All bar three points of light in this image are galaxies. This is an image which is only about, uh, roughly speaking, a quarter the area of the full moon. So it's a very tiny area of space. Hubble is not a wide field instrument. It, it, it really zooms in. Uh, but this is an image showing you that the universe is teeming with galaxies. This particular image was taken uh, with an exposure time of something like four and a half days over a period of about three weeks, because the way the Earth, the way the satellite is orbiting around the Earth, and remember I said you've got to avoid the Earth and the Moon and so on and so forth. So you can't just stick on an object and integrate for a long period of time. So this was a series of snapshots that were then stacked on top of each other to create this four and a half day image exposure. Uh, and as I said, Thousands and thousands of galaxies are out there, giving rise to the estimate that the universe has at a minimum something like 20 trillion galaxies. So to me, this is a, a really wonderful image by the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so Hubble is operational. Hubble initially was able to push our envelope of the universe where we could see back to in time a certain way, and you can see it on this quickie diagram. But as the Hubble Space Telescope was improved markedly with the 1993 servicing mission, but after 2009, you can see we pushed ever further back in time. And that's really the holy grail as far as astronomers are concerned, especially with respect to cosmological astronomers. They want to understand how the universe came into existence back in the vicinity of 13 to 14 billion years ago. And Hubble could only get us so far. Part of the problem, of course, is that Hubble is optimized in the visible. And the visible spectrum or the visible light keeps getting blocked by things like dust and gas. And you just there comes a point where you just can't see what you need to see back far enough. Astronomers recognize this. And once Hubble was operational, then they started turning their attention towards the next generation of space telescope. This eventually becomes the James Webb. And they recognized that they wanted to optimize this particular instrument at the infrared wavelengths so that we could peer through dust and gas and be able to reach back much further in time, much closer to the beginning of time itself. And so from the outset, 1996, people started working really, really hard on trying to sort out what the new telescope, the next generation telescope would look like. They knew based upon Hubble's uh, estimates that oh, it's probably going to cost us 500 million to a billion dollars. And again, starting in 1996, we thought that we'd be able to launch it in 2007. Uh -huh. And it steadily pushed further out and 
just to get to the punchline. We eventually launched James Webb in 2021. So we started in 1996, 2021, 25 years. But if you remember, when we spoke about Hubble, those first committees of NASA, 1970, we launched Hubble in 1990. So it's not that big a difference, really, when all is said and done. At any rate, the price tag and the launch date both inflated, as you can see here. Uh, and by the time we launched the James Webb Telescope, the estimate was somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to $11 billion. However, remember I said, if you include the cost of the servicing missions for Hubble, those numbers, yes, I know I'm comparing different years and numbers and you've got to account for inflation and so on, but comparable numbers of as far as the cost of Hubble is concerned and the cost of Webb. Everybody often cites James Webb as the most expensive science instrument that we've ever launched. And that probably is true, but it's not that much different in my mind to what we spent on Hubble. And both, I'm biased, money well spent. James Webb Telescope itself was going to be much bigger uh, than the uh, than the Hubble Space Telescope. It was named after James Webb, who was the flight controller, sorry, excuse me, was the administrator in NASA during the, its heyday in many ways. You know, the Apollo, the Gemini, the Mercury missions, the race to the moon, James Webb was the NASA administrator. The snag was, he, he the, the telescope was announced with his name on it all the way back in 2002. But in the 20 teens, there was a lot of controversy around his potential role. It was never really cited categorically in what they referred to as the lavender scare of the 1960s. And this was a well, 50s into the 60s. And it basically was at a time when homosexuals employed by the federal government were under, uh, well, under attack, they were being fired and so on. They were certainly being marginalized. Question was, how much of a role did Webb play in that? I am certainly not skilled enough to read anything more than the report that came out on it. And the report basically concluded that while he was probably involved at some level, it was not in a very directed fashion as far as NASA was concerned. And so the name has stuck to that telescope. As you can see, James Webb is quite different to the Hubble Space Telescope. Instead of a single mirror, there are 18 hexagonal pieces. Those are basically beryllium coated gold uh, for reflectivity. There is a huge heat shield or sunshade, which protects the uh, main mirror system. This is a telescope that is optimized in the infrared. And that basically means we have to keep it cold, minus 225 degrees Celsius cold. So this telescope never has seen the sun, never will see the sun. That, that sunshade is designed to deflect away all of the sunlight and make sure that the mirror stability is high and that infrared signature from the telescope itself is low, allowing the telescope to peer back to literally the very moments of time itself, back to within about 180 million years of the Big Bang itself. And that was one of its primary science objectives. So 18 hexagonal mirrors that are all under computer control or under what we call actuators, and they combine their individual light to give us an effective mirror diameter of six and a half meters, which, as I think I mentioned earlier, is about six times the light gathering capability of Hubble. More importantly, this telescope is not in Earth orbit, so it doesn't have to worry about the Earth and the Moon and so on and so forth. It will never observe those objects. Uh, it is out of what we call Lagrange Point 2, roughly speaking, one and a half million kilometers on a line from the Sun to the Earth, one and a half million kilometers beyond the Earth in its orbit around the Sun. And in that position, uh, it is Gravit it's in a relatively what we call gravitationally stable condition, so it doesn't have to do too much to stay in that position and keep the sun shade pointed towards the sun and therefore the mirrors well and truly clear of uh, the, the heat from the sun. This gives you an idea of the size of James Webb. Okay, This is a big telescope. One of the biggest challenges was to get this telescope into the nose cone of the rocket. 
And that's even though this telescope was finished being built in 2016, it underwent better part of five years more testing to make sure that this system would literally unfurl, uncurl out of the nose cone of the Ariane rocket. Doesn't have as many instruments as Hubble. Nonetheless, these instruments are again designed to give you imagery of the sky at infrared wavelengths and to uh, measure spectroscopically what we are looking at. Unlike Hubble, this had more partners. The European Space Agency uh, gave some equipment and they provided the launch on the Ariane 5 launch vehicle. Canada provided one of the three primary uh, science instruments there, NIRIS at the uh, bottom there, and what we call the fine guidance sensors. Uh, so this was a more collaborative endeavor than was the, Jane, uh, than was the Hubble Space Telescope. And as I said, it is optimized to look at infrared, and that gives us the reach back in time. The science objectives, well, not surprisingly, to really unravel some of the cosmological challenges associated with the evolution of the universe. If you can see back to the first stars and the first galaxies and you can follow how they form through time, it gives us insight into the way the universe operated then based upon what we see now. But James Webb is also able to see planets, exoplanets in particular, in unprecedented detail. This is a telescope that can do spectra, can, can take spectra of the atmospheres of those particular planets. Of course, it's able to monitor solar system objects. It's able to do a great deal more than Hubble. But arguably, those first two points is really where uh, the James Webb telescope is supposed to excel. The launch, as I said, occurred December of 2021. It took the better part of three weeks to get it out to L2. During that coast phase, that's when they unfurled the telescope. Over 300 what we call single point failures could have taken place during that unfurling. That is to say, there was no other way to do it other than unlatch, say, a, a switch and let this particular boom unfurl undo this switch, let this happen, undo that. 300, there was not a fingernail on the planet from the astronomical community that was intact during that three weeks. We followed it day by day, and that's what the five years of testing was all about. It arrived at L2, completely unfurled. Not one single failure had occurred, and then the testing period took place and first light as you can see was there in february we commenced science operations in july and the first images were released to the public basically the day after this is the ariane 5 launch it was such a good launch in terms of the characteristics for the orbital insertion at l2 that james webb's onboard fuel tanks were not tapped nearly as much as we anticipated and that basically will mean a greater length of life for james webb out at l2 than we had originally anticipated so well done arian 5. this gives you a little bit of an idea of that sort of three weeks from hell as we were unfurling the telescope on its way out to l2 it's a credit to the engineers. They did a magnificent job and it unfurled perfectly and on schedule. Just to give you an idea of how good the optics are, the image on the left is from the Spitzer telescope, which was one of NASA's great observatories that I mentioned earlier. And the image on the right was one of the first light images from James Webb. It is exquisite as far as its optical capabilities are concerned. And again, not wanting to bore you with lots and lots of photographs, but this was one of the very first images, what they call the Cliffs of Creation there in the Carina Nebula. And basically, this is a stellar nursery. Uh, so all of this dust and gas that you can see in the lower portion of the image, th this is false color, by the way, uh, all of that is representing cocoons and areas within the nebula that are having stars and planets form in real time. You can see one star there or just above center, uh, which seems seems to be uh, you know, poking its nose out of the, uh, 
the, the, the uh, dust and gas from which it formed, which it basically is. And because starlight is so very intense early on in the life of a star, it literally uh, blows away the leftover dust and gas from which it formed. So a beautiful image showing James Webb's capabilities. What do we hope to see from James Webb over the coming years? Well, as I said, hopefully up to about 20 years worth of operation. I'm just coming up on 50 minutes, so I'm going to go over by about one. Uh, but we are expecting to be able to see ever increasing detail about those early moments we've already seen back to within 200 million years of the formation of our universe. So we're looking at galaxies as they are forming. And as you've probably heard in some of those uh, headlines that Jim was referencing earlier, you know, there are bigger galaxies then than we were anticipating. That doesn't mean that the universe is not operating the way we were more or less expecting. It just means that galaxies formed faster than we had really thought was likely back at that point in time. So James Webb is already telling us things that we were not expecting to hear. And we are finding signatures around exoplanetary atmospheres that, again, we had hoped to see, but really did not expect. So it's doing a great job. Everybody who is looking at this data in Canada is a significant player. We have about, oh, something like 6% of all of the time allocation from James Webb, uh, from all, all the universities across Canada. Everybody is just deliriously happy, drunk with delight. Okay, so as you saw, when we got Hubble operational, we started thinking about James Webb. And now that James Webb is deployed, guess what? We're already thinking about the next great leap. In fact, the next uh, uh, generation telescope now referred to as the Nancy Grace Roman. Remember that chief astronomer from the 1960s? Uh, that telescope we started planning back in 2012. Yeah, Webb was supposed to have been launched back then. Uh, but by 2012, we started figuring it out. At the moment, the launch is anticipated to be in 2027. So 15-year lifetime, roughly, uh, sorry, 15-year lead time, if all goes well that sounds fast as far as telescopes are concerned stand by we haven't launched it yet um it's about a three meter diameter sorry about a 2.4 meter diameter telescope so it's basically the same size as hubble uh, also optimized in the infrared uh, to allow us to push further out uh, but this telescope has a much wider field than the james webb telescope so it will engage in differing science projects uh, collaborations with the French Space Agency, the Japanese Aerospace Agency, as well as the European Space Agency. So again, these missions are becoming increasingly international in flavor. Partially, that's to draw on the expertise of so many other groups around the world. It's also to help defray the costs, because to be able to put these telescopes in orbit, wherever that orbit is, is not cheap. They're anticipating a $4 billion cost overall, <clears throat> as I said. It's not launched yet, so stay tuned on that. I hope I have given you some sense of the history of the development of space telescopes. At the moment, the pinnacle is the James Webb Space Telescope, but don't ever forget Hubble. Hubble paved the way. If Hubble hadn't have been as successful as it was at both the science as well as the PR level, James Webb probably would have died on the, uh, the books in 2011. It nearly died at the hands of Congress at that point in time because of the cost overruns, which it was experiencing. But basically, the astronaut community and the public wouldn't let it die. So James Webb owes a lot to Hubble. I fully expect that uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope will do even better. Thank you.